Did you guys hear that? I heard that. Okay, recording in progress. Here we go. And then I do have some people to thank. Um, without the, uh, the wonderful team at YSRT, this day would not be happening. So the vice chair, Kirsten Nilsson, our members at large, Sharon Deeds, Angela Edwards, Sarah Hall, Katrina Kumak, Gloria Larson, Aaron Warnick. And the behind the scenes happening, Patrick Hutchings from the City Library is, um, is making everything home today. We're so grateful. And then another huge thanks for our presenters and for sharing their expertise with us, their experiences and their stories and, uh, and how much I value that. And i um, and grateful that we can all join together in this, in this wonderful Zoom format. If we can't be together, this is amazing that we get to share this way. And without further ado, I think I covered everything. I will turn the time over now to Charlene D. And welcome again, everyone. I think I'll take this one, Lisa. <laughs> Thanks for the intro. No, you're okay. Sorry, Diana. No, it's fine. So we are so happy to be here. Welcome, everyone. We're finally able to share our completed project, Let's Talk Race, Racial Literacy Toolkits. And we've got so much to talk about, and I hope that we can get to it all. We're, we're going to get to it all. Um, but for efficiency's sake, we're, we're going to hold off on answering questions until the end of the presentation. And I'll be your moderator then. But you can submit your questions via the chat at any point. I, I know that I struggle to remember my questions if I don't really get them out there in the moment that they come to me. So uh, we're just gonna not read them out loud until the very end of the presentation. And I'll really try to prioritize those questions with like the more complicated answers because we will be able to answer questions through email as well. So I think let's get started here. Spacebar doesn't work. And we're going to briefly talk about who we are and really what brought us or inspired us to join this project. We're going to talk about why I talk race and racial literacy. Um, we're going to get into some details about developing our kits, really the things that worked well and some of the challenges. And then we are also going to share some great resources that really helped us in our journey and hopefully will help you as well. So with that in mind, I am going to turn it over to our project manager and really the person that inspired this project, Charlene. Hi, everyone. I'm Charlene D. Um, I am a parent, first and foremost. I have a three-year-old son. I'm also a writer. And so prior to coming to the library world, I, I worked in journalism as well as nonprofit management. And here at the City Library, I've done quite a bit of children's programming. And um, I was really excited to be a part of this project because it was something really close to my heart, wanting to empower other parents like myself. Diana, you're up. All right. Hi, everyone. Again, I'm Diana. I'm also a parent to an almost three year old daughter. I have a master's in education, and I really thought that was going to be my field until I started working in libraries. Um, I dabbled as an associate children li children's librarian, and then I really got into human resources, where I um, co-founded our first equity, diversity and inclusion council at the library, at the city library. And so that's kind of really what um, motivated me to join this team and um, really take an active role in putting this together. Lindsay. Hi, friends. My name is Lindsay Watts, and I'm a children's librarian at the Anderson Foothill branch of the city library. Worked in libraries for a little over 16 years, and I also have my master's in library science. Um, and I have some experience creating uh, past literacy kits, kind of more the traditional route of what you might think of as like a literacy kit for children. So I have some experience there and um, I was, I was, I am also really excited to be a uh, part of this project and I learned so much from my teammates and uh, I hope that you will also learn from this group as well. Hi everyone, my name is Nancy Funes. I am a children's librarian at the Day Riverside branch of the City Library. Um, I've been in libraries for about 14 years now and I also have a master's in library science. I am also on the EDI Council with Diana here at the City Library. 
um, and I'm currently serving on the ALSC Budget Committee and the ALSC Notable Children's Book Committee. Thanks, everyone. All right, so let's get into it. Why talk race? So to start, I wanted to set the stage by mentioning a book called Nurture Shock. Um, this is by Poe Bronson and Ashley Merriman. And let's just take a moment to read this quote. It says, to be effective, researchers, researchers have found explicit uh, conversations about race have to be explicit in unmistakable terms that children understand. Now, I'd like to tell a story as to why that's important. And this is also in the book. Um, the year is 2006, and the place is the Children's Research Lab at the University of Texas at Austin. There's a researcher there named Bridget Vitrup, and she recruits 100 families to participate in a study on racial attitudes. All the families are white, and all of them have a kid between the ages of five and seven. And the study was specifically about interracial friendships and promoting their value. Now, what Bridget did was she split, split the families up into three different groups, okay? So the first group just watched videos about multicultural themes. I think they had like a Sesame Street episode where they visited a Black family and like, you know, went to their home and saw how they lived. And another one where um, a multicultural group of people in the neighborhood all banded together to clean up trash. Um, now, she didn't think that just watching videos would be quite enough to move the needle on racial attitudes. But the second group, the second group watched the videos, plus she gave each parent in that group a checklist of topics to talk about. And the topics were all related to race and um, how interracial friendships were beneficial and they tied into those videos. And then she had a third group that just got the checklist with no videos. Now, just take a, take a few seconds, take a moment to predict what, what do you think happened? What do you think was the outcome of the race, of the, of the um, study? Do you have a hypothesis? Okay, I'll tell you. So all the results came back and she found out that the three groups of children were statistically the same. There was no difference between any of the three groups. And it seemed like the study had failed. Not only was there no difference between the three groups, but no none of them had really, that the needle hadn't moved. It seemed like nobody had really improved their racial attitudes. So she looked deeper. And the parents had kept journals during the week of the study. And after looking through these journals, she realized that almost none of the parents had actually followed through with the checklist in terms of talking about race. Instead of discussing race explicitly and directly, they resorted to using phrases like, you know, everyone's equal. We love everybody. Um, skin doesn't really matter. What these parents wanted was for their children to be colorblind. They really wanted race not to be an important factor. But the truth is kids aren't colorblind because like any good scholar, Bridget had actually taken a baseline temperature of racial attitudes for the kids before they took part in the study. And keep in mind that all the families who, are, who participated in the study, they all said that this was a valuable topic. Race was important to them. Racial justice was important to them, yet, when the parents asked, when the researcher Bridget asked the kids, do your parents like black people? 38% of those kids said, I don't know. You know, even though parents felt a certain way that wasn't necessarily being transmitted to the kids because they weren't being clear, they weren't being open about race. That's pretty sobering. But here's the most interesting, most valuable part of the study. So if you don't remember anything else, just remember this. Out of those hundred families that took part, it turns out that six, only six families managed to discuss the checklist with their kids. And guess what? All six of those kids dramatically improved their racial attitudes in as little as one week. That's all it took. Direct conversations about race, one week of those conversations and attitudes were changed. And um, that's so powerful to me. And I think that really inspired the creation of these racial literacy kits, knowing that those conversations can make such a big difference. And those parents, a lot of parents came back to the researcher afterwards and say, said, you know what? We didn't know what to say um, about race. We didn't know what to say. We didn't want to say the wrong thing. Um, and that's, that's really what we're hoping to do with these kits is to 
empower parents even more, support them even more. So if they want to talk about race, but they don't know how to do it, we hope that by, um, by using our kit, they'll, they'll be able to find the right words and they'll be able to have those important conversations. Okay, back to you, Diane. Great. So I think what Charlene was expressing is so important, and I want us to think about that um, as adults, right? Um, what does racial literacy mean? And now let's consider a couple of questions, and these are things that I have myself struggled with from time to time and continue to struggle with. And I really want us to just think about it and internalize them. Um, are we, are you comfortable talking about race? And does that change if you're talking to a black person or a person of color? Do you avoid saying black people to a black person? And so th these are the types of questions that um, really matter when we are engaging with other people, right? With other people from different walks of life and different experiences. And racial literacy means having the knowledge, the tools and the awareness be able to to do just that to be able to talk about race comfortably and this is crucial right when we're thinking about what racial literacy means for children right how do we give our children these tools how do we help them because according to baron and banaji children start receiving explicit and implicit messages about the meaning of race from birth and begin to show pro-white and anti-black bias by age three, my daughter's age, Charlene's son's age. So our children need our help, right? They need our help to learn about race and racial literacy promotes this positive racial awareness development in children. They'll be able to see themselves in a positive light and to be able to see others in that positive light because racial literacy is not just for black children or children of color, right? It's for all children. And so important is this a ability to recognize, address and counter different forms of everyday racism, right? We are trying to develop anti-racist children, right? We want children to be able to say that was unfair, that wasn't right. And to have the knowledge and confidence to be able to do that is really important. <clears throat> and so our team really wanted to emphasize two key concepts of racial literacy. And the first one is this idea of being color brave, which is a idea pioneered by Melody Hobson. And so this idea is that racial injustice is very real and it is very wrong. But when we take a colorblind approach, or when we say like we don't see color, we're suggesting that a person's race does not impact their lives. We're invalidating those experiences of Black people and people of color, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. <clears throat> and the other thought and the other idea that we wanted to emphasize is this idea of owning our mistakes. This team really wanted to foster accountability because too often what we see is this idea of not racist versus racist. Like I could never be racist. And that's not entirely accurate, right? Because we all make mistakes and we all have upheld or perpetuated a racist idea at one point or another. It's just an inevitability. And when this happens, really acknowledging our mistake, the harm that we've done, and focusing on what can we do now? How can we do this better? And how can we repair that harm? And I'll turn it over to Lindsay. All right, so how can libraries help? How are we positioned in a way to um, bridge this racial literacy gap with children. Um, and so I just want to point out, and I'm sure if you are all children's librarians and uh, have contact with like your local schools, um, I'm sure you are know that, you know, racial literacy is not exactly a mandatory curriculum for teachers. You know, they focus on a civil rights movement when an upper elementary grades. Uh, focusing on learning about Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, historic figures during that movement. Uh, but few teachers um, 
really, you know, focus on what's going on today. Um, and from my experience, rarely dive into uh, racism beyond the basics. It's not basic, but, you know, of the US slavery, you know, past. Seems like that's kind of more of the focus. So um, I know that lots of us have relationships with schools. And I think, as I mentioned, we're in unique positions to offer teachers resources um, and be advocates for marginalized uh, communities. So um, for example, uh, I'll just share my own experience um, with the pre-K schools that I visit. Um, at the beginning of each school year, I always try and build a relationship with the teachers, letting them know that um, I'm happy to help supplement whatever curriculum they're going with, you know, they're teaching, the lessons they're going through um, in any way I can, um, and how I connect with their learning. Um, and I will be honest that this year is the first time I've had any teachers reach out, um, you know, requesting materials on uh, like diverse materials of all kinds. I mean, I, you know, so, um, and I was able to help direct them to some resources, but I think a toolkit of the kind of the kind like what we've created um, is really helpful. Um, for us, we've got resources online that teachers can access or anyone can access, but we also have our physical kits that they could check out as well. Um, and having done some of the research ourselves and learning about you know, what materials are appropriate for the development of these different ages, you know, maybe specifically pre-K if those are the classes you visit, um, you'll be in a good position to help offer teachers appropriate materials to support them. And then I will add um, that libraries are usually in a position to fill in the gaps, like Lindsay said, of, of things that are not in their curriculum. Um, and I know for this kit, once we are able to have in-person services again and programming, uh, at least here at the City Library, uh, we are hoping to start uh, things like Let's Talk Race group programs, group story times, and family discussions um, so that we can kind of fill in those gaps in our community. So. Thank you, ladies. So I think this quote really summarizes why we got started on this journey. So Angela Davis is quoted as saying, in a racist society, it's not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. And what that really means is like, we need to be active in this. We need to act intentionally. If we want to help our children, then we need to do something about it, right? Aha, let's get into it then. What about these kits? What went into them? Okay, so for these kits, we opted to develop three different types of toolkits, one for children at each level of development. Um, now for babies and toddlers, we really wanted to focus on what they're focusing on. They're visually taking in the world around them and they're just noticing physical difference. Oh, my skin is light brown and Lindsay's skin is sort of peachy white. My hair is straight and black. Somebody else's hair might be black and coily. And letting them know that these physical differences are normal, they're natural, um, and they're just a normal part of being human. And we use some of those physical differences to differentiate people, and that's, what, that's what's called race. Once we get into the preschool age, um, we start talking about fair versus unfair. So we're still noticing those physical differences, but hey, now those physical differences mean that sometimes we're making assumptions about people based on those differences, or we're, we're telling stories about people based on those differences that may or may not be true. And when we're talking about race and racism at this point, sometimes we'll, we'll just be using those simple concepts. Is that fair? Is that unfair? Finally, once we get into elementary school, and for those kids, those were developed up to grade five, this is now a deeper, deeper exploration of racism. We're naming racism, we're talking about structural racism and systemic racism, we're looking at um, history as well, but to balance all of that in each one of these cases, we're also, um, we're also showing portraits of Black, Indigenous, and children of color 
just going about their everyday lives, experiencing joy, because we want to we balance some of those topics as well. Now, I know that not all libraries may want to develop three different types of kits. And so if you'd like to do an all-inclusive, all-in-one kit for all age groups, um, I will definitely hit on that in the resources as well, how you can do that. Now, um, in terms of what's in the kits, they're available in physical and electronic form. So we use an online platform called um, uh, Biblioboard, and uh, we also uh, have um, in, in, and we also have physical kits that come in bags. And each kit has a selection of picture books, about five to seven. Um, we have a caregiver's guide, which is a, a, a sheet that um, has discussion discussion questions, and also um, it gives parents a sense of like how to set the stage for, for conversations and what are sort of key concepts that they should know. Um, each book itself also has a guide with questions about the book's topics. And we also included toys and manipulatives um, in the physical kits. Um, for the electronic kits on our online resource, we have videos um, of us reading the books, um, but of course toys are not included. And here, just a, a quick picture of some of the cute, uh, cute toys that we've got. This is in the pre-K kit. We've got a little stuffy, some puzzles, a lacing tool, and of course, some crafts. Diana, back to you. Oh, <laughs> great. So, um... What were our goals as a team? So there's so much that we can discuss, right, in terms of race and racial literacy for our children. But I think a couple of the main things we wanted to do were to offer support. Um, this is these are really complicated topics, um, and they can be uh, a little bit difficult to to do on your own. And so learn concepts about racism and reflect on our own lives. I think is really important engaging with the material, like really understanding the material through our own lens. Um, mainly, we wanted to have parents and caregivers really have these conversations, and really encourage them to have these conversations with children. I mean, we are the ones that are going to walk them through this. And really affirming, um, excuse me, sorry, that we all have a part to play in in social justice, you know, it's not just a black person problem. It's not just an indigenous person problem. It's all of our problem, and we all need to take responsibility for that. So those the, we had some other goals, but those are the ones that we really wanted to highlight and, and emphasize. Now, in terms of planning the kits, um, we'll just walk you through what we did to create them. And uh, the first step was that um, I emailed um, Deanna Romreal. I'm sure many of you know her. She's the children's coordinator here at the City Library. And in my proposal, I, I basically said, this is what I think should go in the kits. I based them off of our existing literacy kits, which had picture books and manipulatives. But instead of a song sheet that we often include, um, I suggested including these discussion guides and caregiver guides. And um, I linked to some resources that I thought that we could use to make the kits. Um, we waited to get approval. Um, we did get a green light from our executive leadership, le leadership team pretty quickly. And as soon as we got that approval to move forward with the project, we started assembling the team. I had spoken with Diana about that project early on, and she suggested some people that would be a good fit. And one of them was Nancy. And of course, Nancy was just a powerhouse on the team. She had a lot of experience, a lot of experience working with um, families of color. She'd also had experience in creating book lists um, that feature um, authors and illustrators of color. So I knew that she was already deeply involved in that in that world. We had someone named. Um, Kanika Welch, and Kanika Welch, um, who was an educator, and she had, you know, lived experience as a Black person, and she really brought a wonderful perspective to the team as well. And she was on board for um, one of the kits, and then she had to move to a different state, um, and we we miss her. Um, and then um, I had worked with Lindsay on a lot of children's projects, and I knew that she was also a powerhouse. Um, eventually, D Diana also joined us, and because of her experience with the um, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Council, we knew that she would have a lot of um, race-related knowledge to impart. And so that's how we um, created the team. 
Then when it came to logistics, we re-met with the coordinator, the children's coordinator, to discuss just the nitty gritty, how much it's gonna cost, how long it's gonna take, um, what we need to do in order to, to actually bring the, bring the kits to life. And um, Nancy also reached out to um, uh, another library who had done a similar project and we, we, we picked their brains for some of their advice. So Nancy's gonna tell us about that. Yeah, so oh, I, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I had a colleague uh, who mentioned the We Story kits that were being used at the St. Louis County Public Library. Uh, so I reached out to the librarian out there um, and she was awesome and uh, was able to meet with us so that we could kind of figure out what, what we wanted to do, what we didn't want to do with these kids. Um, and we made a lot of decisions based on that um, meeting. They had some really great kits, um, but one of the things that we noticed about their kits that we wanted to change for ours was that the language being used in their kits was very academic. Um, and so it wasn't accessible to a lot of parents that wanted to have these conversations um, without reading like a ton of material. Um, so we wanted to make sure of, out of that that we created really accessible guides. Um, we also wanted to include almost exclusively own voices stories um, where their kids did not make that a priority. Um, so we, we made a lot of changes based off of that. So, um, while we were developing the kits, everybody uh, on the team would submit three to five books for consideration that we thought would be a good fit for that kit. Um, we, when we decided what books we were going to use, everybody got assigned a book or two. Um, and the books you were assigned to, you would have need to write up a discussion guide for that book, as well as record your read aloud video that we can include on our Biblio board platform. Um, we all submitted information to the caregiver guide, um, things that we thought were important, ideas for parents to look at, uh, reasons why having these conversations at this age was important. Um, and then once we had taken care of kind of that big part of the kit, we would focus on manipulatives. And so everyone would submit ideas for manipulatives. We would try to pick things that, um, related to the story in some way, um, but we also wanted craft activities in there. Um, so yeah, um, as far as book selections, um, so while we each submitted three to five books, we were probably reading about 10 to 15 books each per kit um, to really narrow it down to the books that we were perfect for this kit. Um, the, sometimes we would find that there was a book that we thought would maybe fit and we wouldn't have it in our collection. And so while we were doing this project, we were finding gaps in our own library collection. Um, and so when that was the case, we would go to YouTube and we would often find a read aloud um, so that we could vet the book and make sure that it would be something uh, that could be in our kit. And we found a lot of books that way. Um, and then we had criteria, like I mentioned earlier, um, one of the biggest criteria we had was that we wanted books that were own voices books, books that were written by people from those communities with lived experiences on the topics. Um, that was very important to us to make sure that those voices and stories were authentic. Um, we also wanted a balance, as uh, Charlene has mentioned, um, making sure we're including books with challenging topics that are straight to the point on these topics, um, but also books that just were about joy and empowerment in being yourself. Um, so that was a really important, and then we were often, we often switched books out when we thought we, we had made our selection of five to seven books. Um, and then we would look at the balance and say, no, we gotta switch something out. Um, and then obviously diversity was really important to us. We wanted to make sure we included a variety of racial and ethnic perspectives. Um, so uh, we would make sure that we had stories about black children, about indigenous communities, about uh, Latinx communities, uh, Asian communities. Um, and then we would book talk as a team, listen to each other's perspectives, kind of debate back and forth, which book would be the good pick for this topic or this topic. Um, and then as a team, we would make our selections. 
And so these were the book selections for our pre-K toolkit. And then this is what the guides looked like. So the one on the far left is the caregiver guide that kind of gives an overview of uh, what the kit is for, how to use the kit, some ideas for general discussion. And then the other two are the book discussion kits. So they'll have the cover of the book, topics for conversation, and then specific discussion questions about each book. And this one goes over to Lindsay. Okay, so um, once we had finally submitted our uh, discussion questions or opportunity, discussion opportunities, um, we would go through a round of edits. So everyone's editing and commenting on each other's, um, you know, discussion questions, making sure that we're uh, addressing all of the relevant topics within that book um, and making sure we're using appropriate language and even uh, submitting to the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Council to get feedback from them, uh, which was really important, uh, especially once Kanika left as well. Um, and then uh, once we had landed on uh, our final, you know, discussion questions and uh, parent guides, uh, then we would kind of split up the work as far as formatting. So a few uh, members of the team would use the templates that our marketing department created for us to, you know, format that all into those nice uh, images that we saw of, the, of those discussion guides when Nancy was talking. Um, and then uh, we would submit our read aloud videos and discussion guides to Deanna Ramriel who would uh, help us post onto BiblioBoard so that families who can't access physical library materials can go online and access them that way. And then um, we had one team member, me, <laughs> who uh, I, uh, because I had experience working with kids in the past uh, with our system, um, I worked with the techn technical services department to make sure everything was ordered um, make sure the bags were put together correctly and even photographed to use for publicity um, for marketing purposes. And um, so that's how it worked for us. Like you might not have someone who was in technical services, but making sure you kind of got someone in place to help with all of those aspects is great. I think that's all for me. <laughs> Yeah, and so as Lindsay mentioned, we did use a lot of collaboration throughout the library, but um, if you perhaps are a small organization or like you're, you know, a sole person in children's services at your branch or, or at your library, um, a lot of this stuff can be done either in-house or including members of the community. So reaching out and finding um, maybe um, a family of color that might want to volunteer on this project or to be paid um, a small fee to, 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 to work on the project with you. Um, and uh, the, the only thing that I would say is that um, if, if you are gonna do this, just be sure that it's not one person doing it alone. Just make sure that it's some kind of team, even, even if you don't have like a marketing department or you know, an equity, diversity, inclusion council, just make sure that you have a couple people throughout the organization who have their eyes on this so that you can get multiple perspectives. Um, and um, a big part of the project for us was working with marketing, um, but, there was an alternative, Canva, that was free. And Nancy did a really great job of working with that and she'll explain. Yeah, so if you don't know about Canva, Canva is a free uh, graphic design uh, web-based tool. So you don't even have to install it or anything. It's just in the web browser. Um, and it comes with like pre-made templates and you can uh, customize them. And um, so we, I actually ended up using Canva to format our first draft of the caregiver guides and the book discussion guides because uh, we knew that we were gonna be finished with our end of things before marketing was gonna be able to step in and really create anything for us. And we wanted to make sure that we had something to post on BiblioBoard as soon as we could. Um, so I created this Canva on the left uh, and that was our original design. And the design for this project is really intentional. Um, we wanted to make sure that we didn't fall into the trap of skirting on diversity issues by using animals instead of people. 
Um, I'm sure a lot of you are may, have maybe heard of the Cooperative Children's Book Center. They put out a report every year on the state of diversity in children's publishing. And while the numbers are getting better, uh, they're usually pretty sad. <laughs> um, oftentimes the percentage of books published about animals or anthropomorphized <laughs> uh, objects, uh, the percentage of those books being published is often higher than the percentage of books about or by BIPOC people put together. Um, and so we didn't want to fall into that trap, um, but we also didn't want to unintentionally tokenize um, by using some characters and not other characters with different skin tone. Um, and so we decided on a very neutral uh, kind of shape block color design. Um, we also didn't want to unintentionally exclude families by having them think that if they're not represented in the imagery of the kit, then the kit is not for them. Um, so we went with this really neutral shape design. Um, and then when we finally got marketing on board, they created something that was a little bit more on brand for our city library um, that kind of fit everything else that we make. And it's a really, um, I think, uh, accessible document that um, is easy to read. It's, it doesn't feel overwhelming when you look at it, um, but you can totally do this for free on Canva. There is a premium version of Canva that has some really nice features, but you can totally make it for free on Canva with their free version. It's, it's a great tool if you've never used it. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about cost, um, especially since whereas I worked with, you know, technical services um, and getting uh, materials uh, that we wanted to our technical services uh, rep. Um, so as you can see, the average cost for our kits was uh, between 95 and 180 per kit. Um, and our project in total, we're very lucky and we were able to uh, get um, 5,000 for our project in total. So um, you can see the things that aren't, you know, uh, included and are something that you need to consider in these kits. But um, I would say like, if, if you're going towards a project like this, um, thinking about if you're going to need to bring on a paid consultant or if you've got um, local members of community that you're going to compensate for their time, um, thinking about how that's going to be part of your budget. Um, and then also sustainability for your project as well, right? So um, like, do you have money left over to replace materials that get damaged or well loved by people who are hopefully, you know, constantly checking out your kits or utilizing your materials? Um, and what about next year in the future? Uh, so thinking about um, having a sustainable budget or working with the current budget you have and setting aside money that way. Um, so yeah, I think those are things to really important to consider. So we've got uh, five to seven titles, several manipulatives, uh, staff time is also part of your cost, right? Um, and so just making sure you've got that all well divided um, and making sure it also fits together in your bags. <laughs> hey, Lindsay, this is, this is Lisa chiming in. I'm so sorry, just one yeah. moment. I just wanted to give you all, to let you know that um, we're at 1040. So I just want to let you know that the Q&As are, are, are coming close. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Lisa. Perfect. Oh, oh, we're and, nearly and there. I, just before you mentioned this, I just want to jump in. We did mention the EDI consultant costs in the previous slide, but just know we did not use an EDI consultant because um, we got this approved at the very end of a budget cycle. So we didn't, we didn't sort of um, anticipate the costs and stuff like that. So we did not use an EDI consultant. Um, but we just put that number in because sometimes people are surprised by the hourly rate, but they do really valuable work. And so they're kind of, they're, they're pricey, but it's worth it if you decide to go that way. So just wanted to <laughs> mention that. Thanks, Charlene. Okay, I'm going to briefly talk about some challenges. And these are things that sort of held us up um, along the way. But I really love talking about challenges because it makes me feel like 
superhero, like we overcame all these things. And you'll be surprised how difficult book selection was and really finding that balance between heartache and joy and, and uh, encouraging a, a holistic view of um, different communities and races and ethnicities, right? So we have books on um, Black children at school, but we also have books on uh, Muslim Black children, right? And so we wanted to find a whole holistic approach to, to, all, to our books. Um, you'll also be surprised that it, this is time intensive. Be prepared for long discussions, for like battles between books. It's, it, it gets exciting. Um, I think Nancy really mentioned really, really focus on listening to people's perspectives. Um, and remember that we all have, you know, that same target, that same goal. Um, and I think we need to be really mindful and intentional of who we are including in the creation process. You know, it's not just about getting feedback from Black, Indigenous, and, and people of color. It's allowing them, allowing them, it's um, inviting them to co-create and lead these discussions. Um, and, and, and that can be difficult for, for smaller libraries and things who don't have a lot of racial and ethnic diversity within their library. But again, being active and intentional and finding those uh, people who can help. And then marketing. So how are we gonna promote this within our community? If you don't have a marketing team, that becomes a, a lot more challenging. And even working with our marketing department has its challenges as well. You know, they have, um, they, they're super skilled and knowledgeable in, in ways that things sell or things that sell well. Um, and so having those long conversations with marketing, it's really important as well. Resources, yay! You're on mute. Thanks, Diana. Okay, so um, for resources, these are the primary ones that we used. Um, the Conscious Kid was our main resources. Anytime we had a question, oh, how, how should we describe indigenous communities? Oh, what, what does structural racism really mean? We would go to the Conscious Kid. Um, Embrace race was really practical. It's full of lists that have tips. How do you choose a good picture book about race? If you're reading with a race conscious lens, what kind of questions do you ask? Um, and just basics about talking about race with kids. Now, Diverse Book Finder was one that I really wanted to highlight. This very first link, Steps for Using Picture Books to Talk About Race. We'll send this out afterwards. Please, please click on that link because it has a step-by-step -step guide for how to talk to about race with kids of all ages, basically from like pre-K through third grade. And it starts with noticing physical differences and it moves all the way through um, being fair and unfair. And oh, is this a racist act? And also how do you respond to that? How can you stand in solidarity, solidarity with somebody who might have had something um, unfortunate happen to them? Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, Jessica Ann Bratt, she is a rock star librarian. I think she's based out of Michigan, if I'm not mistaken, and she has a whole guide on how to talk about race and story times. She also has a webinar, so this is something you'd like to incorporate into your, um, your services um, where you are. I would highly recommend checking her out. Um, Nurture Shock, um, the, the story that I told at the very beginning of this uh, of this this uh, session was from this book, and I would recommend reading um, reading the chapter on on why parent education is key, and that's linked there as well. Finally, we had some great blogs that we relied on, especially for book choices. Um, one with Muslim librarians, one about American Indians and children's literature, and also one um, about Latinx kids and kids. So those were our top six resources. And and we'll be sharing all our slides. So. No worries if he didn't get it to write it down. <laughs> and here are our finished products. These are the physical kits. Anybody want to say much about it? We are we are so close to out of time, and we do have some some chats going on. So I do want to stop sharing. Actually, I'm going to go to this last slide that says thanks, and we can open it up with chats. <clears throat> Um, oh, Charlene, you already answered. <laughs> Let's see, do you have any plans to make these kit, these kinds of kits for YA audiences? Have suggestions for those who'd like to do this for tweens and teens? That's a great question. Does anybody want to tackle this? 
I mean, Charlene, this was your project. Did you envision um, going beyond elementary? Um, you know what, I didn't because it's not as much my area of expertise. Um, I, <coughs> I, I really just focused on early literacy, um, but there are resources out there for, um, for YA audiences. It looked like Nancy might have had something to, to offer. I was just gonna say, we did have some tentative plans to put together a Spanish language kit. Um, if you have any experience in trying to find a Spanish language translated titles for children, you know that that is a little bit difficult. Um, so it'll be a challenge, but it's it's in the plans somewhere for a, at least for a Spanish language kit. But. Um, Charlene, any specific resources for the for tweens to do this for like teens and tweens? No, unfortunately, nothing off the top of my head. I really wish I did, but um, I'm happy to do a little bit of research and then send an email out to everybody. But unfortunately, I don't have anything right now. Um, I do want to answer a question that was up at the top, though. It mentioned, is the staff time listed in your budget total man hours or each committee mem member? And it was for each committee member, but um, I do want to say that it varied quite a bit. Um, I was the team lead, and I did a lot of the um, of the writing for it and the formatting as well. And so it was probably closer to four hours a week for me. Um, for other members, it probably approached um, four hours um, when they were in an intensive period, like book selection. That was a ton of reading, so that took up a lot of time. For Lindsay, when she was liaising with technical services, that took up a lot of time. When Nancy was designing the kits before we had marketing come in, that took up a lot of time. Otherwise, in gen if, you, if you weren't you know, in a high work period, it was maybe an hour or less per week. Thanks, Charlene. I also wanted to go back to that teen question because I think we did talk about in the beginning going beyond elementary school. And we did mention that some of the, the teens are more well-versed in terms of racial literacy than we are. And so I think really talking with teens and figuring out their needs or, or what they want to learn about is, is really important. So really co-creating this with your teens and your tweens is, is probably the, the, the route that I would take. Any other questions? And you can always email, um, Charlene here is our project manager, so this is her email here, um, but you can email anyone on the team as well and we can, we can get back to you. We'll also be sharing our slides. Yeah, thank you so much everyone for um, coming to this and um, for, for your questions and uh, yeah, we really appreciate having you all here. Wow. Oh, wait, I think we might have a question. Oh, the timing could not have been more perfect. Um, thank you all so much. That was such a fantastic presentation, well thought out. And um, we will have all of this available on ULA's, on the website, on the YSRT tab. And um, thank you, Diana, Lindsay, Charlene, and Nancy. This was amazing. And a couple things uh, for the rest of you. Apparently there, were, there may have been some bad link that went out on Zoom, heaven forbid. So I am dropping that in the chat right now. And um, so if you have colleagues that are like, how do I get in? Um, kindly share this with them if I, my mad skills. Oh, there they go. Okay, so there it is in the chat. Also take a break. We'll be back at 11. We have a wonderful program on virtual programming. The good, the bad, the great. It's really all been good because what else are we going to do in this crazy time that we've all been living through? Um, yeah, so go let the dog out, get a drink bathroom break and um, and thank you again to the city library and for your uh, for everyone's help in this presentation. All right, I'm going to stop recording and um, and we are going to see you all in just a little bit. Take care everyone. <laughs>